Okay, what's going on guys? Waco and Jeremiah Chan from Revolution, and we're here to do our summary of Watches and Wonders. But before we get to Watches and Wonders, we have to talk about the two launches that happened in the week just previous. Uh, which sort of both of which broke the internet. So yeah, and the first one you got, you got to talk about is set the watch will align, and that's the moon swatch. <laughs> exactly. So we're both uh, wearing the moon swatches. Um, Jeremiah is wearing the mission to Mercury, and I'm wearing the mission to Mars. Uh, the mission to Mars I love as well because it's obviously an homage to the Alaska project. Uh, what I like about these watches is if you're a speedy nerd in the way that I am, like you look Score at them, you're line. like, dude, they're so dope, right? Yeah. Like, look at the bezel, dot over ninety. I mean, yes. it's insane, right? And if you if you go zoom in real close, you can see a small etching of the Swatch logo, the yes. S underneath the crystal. Yes. Just like what you find on the you know, actual moon watch. Precisely. Uh, and I love the fact that on this watch, um, they've got the capsule uh, indicators, you know, for the, the, the chronograph information. Yeah, step dial. They've got it all right. It's all there. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about this, this phenomenon. Um, so what can I say? So I, everywhere I went, on the day that it was launched, as I imagine many of you guys did as well, um, it was pandemonium, right? Like there were just like, I think in Geneva, which is where I was at the time, getting ready for Watches and Wonders, there was like a line, I kid you not, a thousand people long, right? It, it went on for a kilometer, it snaked around um, a Rue de Rhone and then went up into the Old Town and circled back on itself. It was just absolutely nuts. And people were queuing there uh, from the night before, right? right. You know, I remember when I went to go see the watches um, at the Swatch uh, manufacturer, um, already I was sort of like overwhelmed with this sort of very visceral sense of excitement. Um, Actually, did you get to see all 11? I did. Already? I did. I, did. I saw them in the, in the suitcase. Wow. Um, of course, I, off, I asked if I could buy the suitcase. They said no. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to try as always. But okay, let's backtrack a little bit because do you remember we were sitting here in the office, right? Yes. And then we heard about this collaboration between Swatch and Omega and we knew it was bioceramic and somehow Omega was involved. And I have to say, guys, Way called it. Way called it. <laughs> So, well, it's nice of you to say, but 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 I was kind of thinking like, okay, what is it possibly that they're going to do, right? Um, and I always liked the idea of like, you know, like, um, you remember like there are certain brands that had service watches, right? That were made of plastic. And then those service watches became like iconic unto their own right. Right. You know? Just that, kind of like a placeholder, you know, when you've sent your watch in. Yes, exactly. Right. And then people would keep them and so on, for example, and, and they would become like collectible into their own right, you know? And, and at the same time, there have been, you know, this whole culture of collectability for, for swatches as well. You know, like, uh, I mean, you, you you're too young to, to remember, but there was an era like with the Keith Haring watches, with all of these watches that featured like, you know, seminal artists and so on like that. Um, people were genuinely obsessed with them. And I think that still has continued to this day, but it was really interesting because um, it, like, I think for them, they want to kind of create the most sort of earth shattering and groundbreaking collaboration. Yes. And I love the fact that they were like, okay, we have this bioceramic, we can make really cool watches with it. Let's make something from within our own group. And if you look around that group, and there's many super iconic watches, but definitely the most appropriate one was the Speedmaster because that watch is mythological. It's probably right. the most famous chronograph of all time. Yeah, and rightly right? so. And rightly so. I mean, the fascination with just space exploration and just, you know, man looking to the stars, right. I think it, it crosses cultural differences, language barriers, and, you know, as fans of the Speedmaster, I mean, my personal opinion to me, it's, it's the ultimate chronograph. Dude, yeah. totally. I mean, I, I love that watch. You know, I'm a speedy guy, you know, I have a huge speedy collection as well. Well, not huge, but it's, it's a, a very large focus of my collecting. Uh, and I also love the people at Omega. I think they're incredible people. I, I love Reynold Eichelman, Greg Kisling. Um, uh, everyone that's there um, is so passionate about that, uh, about their brand. So, you know, entrenched with like just great knowledge about their brand. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to see, right? When you interviewed uh, Reynold in, in Switzerland and, you know, you're talking about the moon swatch, I mean, how did he feel about it? Well, you know, that's the question. Um, I, I think, uh, so there has been some conversation as to, okay, everyone says like, this is great for um, Swash, Swash, right? Yeah. Um, but, but maybe not so for Omega. Well, actually, I disagree. I, I, I actually think it's really good for Omega, right? And I think that, that for, you know, people need to sort of um, think beyond, like, the, like, to me, very facile comparisons between like, oh, well, if you have this watch, what, why would you buy the real one, right? right? Or if you want to call the Omega Speedmaster the real one. 
I think that the two are equating price to collectability. You know, yes, but but I, I think that the two um, watches occupy completely different um, uh, positions, right? Yes. Like I think for every person that wants a wonderful mechanical chronograph, they will eventually land at the Speedmaster. Maybe sooner because this watch now has helped the entire world and a whole younger generation be sort of inundated with Speedmaster culture, right? Not just the younger generation, you know. My peers, friends of mine, they I were consider asking, you yeah. young as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, friends of friends of mine, they were asking they completely, you know, little to no interest in watches. They were asking, you know, what do you think about the moon swatch? Right. You know, it's a quartz movement. I said, there are quartz movements that are good. And yes, yeah, and absolutely. You just buy what you love. Even my wife was asking. You oh, know, really? She was thinking of getting one. Oh, yeah, so I mean, fun. we we. He had no opportunity to queue up and, and to buy one right at the <laughs> How know, crazy the was it here in Singapore? Oh, it was it was nuts. I think I think there are two Swatch boutiques, one at a mall called uh, Ion and right. the other one in Marina Bay Sands. I saw a video online. Um, some customers were incensed um, because they were told after the fact that the Swatch boutique at Marina Bay did not have enough pieces for you know the number of people that had queued yes. overnight and they were not told. Uh, you know, earlier on. So yeah, but you know, I, again, I, I understand that it's probably reflective in general of the sort of disparity that exists right now between the number of people that want to buy most of the cool watches in the world and the number yeah. of watches that are actually being produced. But again, like I respect the fact that they didn't overproduce the watch. It's, I, I know anyway that they're not limited. They're they're going to be coming to the shops um, and online. Swap and online, it'll and be online. online. So just hang in there, guys. Have some patience, exactly. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's an amazing collaboration. I I think it's it's a brilliant move for Swatch. I also think it's the perfect like post pandemic watch as well. Okay. Because like in this era, like so finally I would like to say, you know, hopefully say that we're kind of over COVID. People are traveling again. I just got off the uh, the plane from Geneva and the plane was packed. Changi Airport here in Singapore was packed. Frankfurt Airport was slammed. Everywhere I went, people were traveling and there is like a really positive mood for the first time. So I think that in some ways, I feel as if Nick Hayek um, was giving the world a watch that's a little bit of a present because everyone that I know who's looked and held like a moon swatch in their hand smiles and feels uplifted by them. And if you look at the colors um, as well, you know, the the baby blue of the the mission to Uranus. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 pun intended. The, 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 the wonderful graphic of the the rings around yeah. uh, you know uh, Saturn, which is at six o'clock on, on the mission to Saturn, like the, these watches are so fun, they're so uplifting, they're so vibrant, and and and, and at the same time, which I, I was mentioning earlier, if you're a Speedmaster dude like you and I are, every like step dial, it's got the as you were saying the the the, the logo in the Hesalite, it's got the dot over ninety, it's actually the size of the case. And the dimensions, the height, the, the exactly diameter, the, the exact yeah. dimensions of a Speedmaster case. I think that's extraordinary. And I think it's only a group that's got the, these synergies that Swatch Group has that is able to achieve something like that. Right? I mean, for us too, as collectors of vintage Speedmasters, I think what it means to us as well is a democratization of, of the Speedmaster. Right. I mean, even if you can't afford a vintage piece, right. you know, prices have softened, but they're still pretty pretty steep. And if, even if you can't afford, uh, you know, the moon watch right now, uh, which is uh, I think about six to seven thousand, depending on it's a Hesalite sapphire bracelet or strap. Right, right. You can. This is a gateway piece. Yeah, you know, you, yeah. It's fun. You can. So that's a question. Eventually, get the moon watch. Yeah. So that's a question I would have for you. You're a speedy guy. Um, does this project make Omega more desirable to you, more relevant to you, or does it in any way affect your perception of the of the, of the Speedmaster? No, I mean to me, it's it's a complete coup for Omega. I think no, because it, it it broadens the fan base of, of the Speedmaster. That's it. Yeah, like we were talking just now, people who completely have no interest in watches now they're thinking, oh, this is an uh, Omega Swatch, a Moon Swatch. What is that? Yeah, you know, they may dive deeper. They may become watch nerds themselves. And I, I totally agree. You know, expanding the tent, expanding the base. I think that's what we're all about. I think you perfectly put it, and I think that's exactly it. It's about it's about reaching a much broader audience, which we, and now has. And I think it's a big win for Omega as well. Okay, so let's go from there to the second uh, launch that happened just before Watches and Wonders, and this was for the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Ultra, the world's thinnest mechanical watch at 1.8 mm. And so when I heard about this watch initially, I was like, that's cool, and I understand like why Bulgari has sort of focused on breaking all these records and they've done so incredibly. This is the eighth right. this uh, is, yeah. record breaker in eight years, I think. Exactly. 
that having been said, um, I was like, is it going to be a concept watch? Is it going to be something that's, you know, a little bit quirky? You know, um, I know disrespect to the, the brands like, you know, that have made watches like that. I mean, I think, you know, Antoine Pin from Bulgari had also said he wanted to give props to Piaget because if Piaget hadn't created the ultimate concept, they would have never done this, right? Right. Uh, and the ultimate concept is incredibly cool, but it's it's necessary to use like a special tool for winding the watch as well, which is, you know, um, that's not the most pragmatic thing in the world. But again, okay, if you're spending half a million dollars on a super concept watch that was the world's thinnest mechanical watch, I understand why that that's part of, of, of reaching for the stars, right? Um, but with this watch, when I put it on my wrist, I was like, wow, it's just so wearable, right? And I think part of that is they made it an integrated bracelet watch as well, and they also made the bracelet 1.8 mm in thickness. I, th I think the bracelet is half the thickness of you know, a normal. standard Octo Finissimo, yeah. Correct, exactly. And so is the clasp as well. And already the Octo Finissimo watch has one of the thinnest clasps around. And then this, because they basically skeletonize it, um, it's even thinner. And I think that's what's so extraordinary about Bulgari. When they do things, they do so, things with such integrity. Uh, incidentally, I've got to give a shout out to uh, to my friends at Bennett Winch. So they make these um, these watch rolls. And it's- They don't really roll. And they don't roll. <laughs> like, so the worst thing about watch rolls is like, you put them in here and they start rolling all over the place or you open it and your watches kind of flip over. These lie flat, which I think is what's so Perfect. cool about it, right? You can display your- And you can use it as a watch tray as well. So you can put your watch there and so on. So, um, yeah. Oh, back to the Bulgari. <laughs> Sorry, back to the Bulgari. <laughs> so that's what I really respect about um, and their watches. And so when they created that watch, they wanted to create a watch without any compromise that, that you could wear however you want. So they have two sort of like horizontal crowns on it, one for time setting, which is um, using a differential mechanism. So you can yes. set it as often as you want, or even if it turns it accidentally, it uh, doesn't- it's the crown on the right, if I recall. Correct. Yeah. It doesn't affect the underlying timekeeping, right? Um, it doesn't affect the train. And then the second is for the winding of the massive um, ratchet wheel, right? And that's the crown on the left, lower left, and you just turn it and it's super easy to use and you can see the barrel winding. But there's something cool on the ratchet wheel. Yes. So I think we should talk about well, that. Well, you, you, you tell me as a person, a young person, like how, what did you think of a QR code that leads you to an NFT? I mean, blockchain and NFTs are like the next big, big thing. And, you know, some people are critical about the metaverse. Like it's something that, you know, the public didn't ask for. Why do we, why do we need it? Right. right. But, you know, I think it's just technology moving forward. It's something new to experience. And I saw on Bulgari's uh, Instagram page that created avatars as well. And, you know, probably you can have a persona or an avatar on it. You can have your Bulgari watch in there. Yeah. I, I, it's just them trying new things. Yeah, honestly, I think there's, you know, why not, right? I think yeah. it's cool, you know? And so, so anyway, bear in mind that if for whatever reason you want to remove that wheel, you probably couldn't put a plane wheel on there yeah, if you, you wanted to, right? Um, but the whole idea was to, yeah, yeah, push boundaries to bring modernity to watchmaking. Don't forget also that it's not an NFT that exists by itself. It's first of all, the world's thinnest mechanical watch that also has an nft as well right, right? I mean, it's so a tangible I, I, asset yes underlying <laughs> that it's you know high high watch making you know exactly yeah. exactly um and so yeah i i i think it's cool and and i i like the idea that they were because i think they were discussing it and fabrizio bonamassa was like you know we're gonna lay this watch out in this sort of regulator format and we want the watch to have you know a decent power reserve so we're gonna put the barrel here and we're gonna have a pretty big ratchet wheel and everyone was talking about the decoration and i think that it was his idea to say you know let's do this and what i like about that was that immediately Jean-Christophe Babin was like, let's do it. I think immediately um, uh, Antoine Pin was like, let's do it. And I love that spirit of innovation. You know, I think that in it, the spirit of innovation is so important. Yeah. And I think that we have to embrace that as well. I mean, you know, we're now do, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak this year, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that has distinguished AP as a brand and has made it so legendary and has made that watch so sort of iconic and seminal is that they've always been on the for forefront of innovation, right? Yeah. Like when, you know, when in 1972, they created the very first integrated bracelet, um, you know. Uh, this is a 5402, guys. Yeah, 5402 <laughs> in yellow gold. Um, but when they created this, this watch basically created the entire category for every integrated bracelet uh, watch that came after that, right? Whether it's a Nautilus, whether it's a 222 that's just come back, what have you. And this as well, right? Like if this didn't exist, this wouldn't exist, and that entire category wouldn't exist. And it, so even if you can't get one, I right. mean, I, I would say don't be a hater. <laughs> <laughs> I also think like, like so I look at like the, the entire history of that brand and it's just constant like pushing boundaries, constant innovation. And if you look at 93 with the offshore, mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy for the for the area in which it is. But what I love about it is that 
AP is always tapped to the zeitgeist of the of the era, exactly. right? And it's always creating watches, not as a trend, but because they're so ahead of it, defining the future mm -hmm. of watchmaking. So anyway, there's a lot more AP content coming up uh, for you guys if, if that's uh, if, if if that's something that you're interested. I'm sure you are. But I also want to talk another about another watch which um, which launched this year as well, and that's the watch you're wearing on your other wrist. Oh, the Mad One Red. So tell us about that. Well, I mean, we were talking about it just now and how, you know, Max Busa really, I feel, democratizes uh, high-end watchmaking with, with this piece, you know, coming up with the ballot system, you know, making it fair. It's not about how much money you have, you know, it's about showing your passion and your genuine interest for the brand and for, you know, what he's, he's created here. And just look at this. Spinning wheel, it's just, like, you never get any work done. I, so, you know, when I think of, of Max Buser, like, there's a Jewish term, mensch, right? A, a mensch is a, an altruistic person. It's a person who, uh, his, his, his primary um, desire is to create goodwill for humanity. And, and I think that that's, you know, I, that's what I associate him with. I associate him with that for many reasons. One is that he basically was the first to put independent watchmaking on, on you know, on, uh, on the stage and give it a spotlight with the Opus Project. He then created an amazing brand, MBNF, which is one of the very few brands that has ha happens to be able to do really modern watches and then really classic watches yes. as well. He can do a hor horological machines, which are yeah. hyper modern, yeah. and legacy. legacy machines, which are, yeah. you know. Um, but then I love the fact that he then decided, despite the fact that his average watches were actually probably the entry price of his, his world is around 80,000 US dollars, and then obviously goes up into like half a million and beyond. Um, he wanted to create something that was um, accessible to the people that work with him, mm -hmm. uh, his friends, the suppliers, like you know, um, uh, the journalists, incidentally, as well. And this, so he created the Mad One, and that watch was uh, just it was 1,900 was Frank's initial version of it, but it was so cool that it basically developed this massive cult following, right? right. And so much so that you know, I think sec on the secondary market versions of, of that watch are going for like twenty, thirty thousand dollars, which is crazy, right? Um, but then now he has created the Mad One Red, which is the first public uh, version because the first watches were created for friends and family, basically. Um, and that watch has also broken the internet. So that's another watch that kind of launched a little bit before Watches and Wonders. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's 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 so cool. And I think yeah, that's just, just yeah, just look at the you know the time display on the side. It's it's classic design language from MBNF. Even the lugs, you see, it's not completely connected to the case. Yes. It's like connected to the case back, and it's. A piece of industrial design that I think is just incredible. A crown at twelve o'clock. Yeah, I, I love the fact that they've kind of like slightly updated it as well. So the initial version has a slightly different crown, um, but it's just cool, right? It's it's a, it's a great looking watch, and it's developed its own sort of cult collectability as well. I, I think. think we can both agree we hope more companies will be willing to do this. Uh, yeah, you know? absolutely. Okay, so let's go from there to Watches and Wonders itself. Um, and so what we, we won't try to go over everything, but we'll start with maybe our top five uh, picks, right? Okay. Okay, um, so I'm gonna say uh, that uh, a watch from a small independent brand called Trilobe, or Trilobe in English, um, absolutely blew my mind, right? It's called Infole Journée. So uh, Trilobe uh, was created by uh, Gauthier Massenet, um, and absolutely, you know, sort of wonderful, down to earth, very humble guy with clearly an incredible vision for watchmaking, right? So, like some other watches that we like, you know, such as Ressence, for example, he wanted to create a new way of reading time, right? He wanted to create an emotional, uh, I guess, poetic interpretation of time. And so, what you see in Ressence watches is you've got the seconds, the minutes, and the hours all rotating on different discs. But then, with the full journey, he basically lifted these discs up into the air. So, it's just, so it looks like you've got three miniature flying saucers suspended on the That's dial. So cool. It was absolutely mind blowing. Um, and with this dome sapphire crystal, it just looked like you, yeah, you had like insight into an alien civilization. Right. Yet, it's something that was truly horological at the same time. So that was what my first pick. What's what's yours? I think my first pick is a watch, unfortunately, that you can't acquire, but. It's the Moser, the Vanta Black. <laughs> that was so fun. Like when I first saw the video, you like you couldn't see the watch Not because it, you, there was a black background against it. Right. You could only see the hands. And I think it's a it's an Agen, Agen Hall movement. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's a chronograph, but you know, it's it's like you can see the hands, but you yes. can't see the watch. Yes. Yeah. So I mean if you don't know what Vanta Black is, it's just like small nanotubes, you know, that just absorb as much light as possible. And it's like the blackest black that you can, it's not paint, right? But it's the blackest black that 
that you can find here on Earth. And because it's made of these nanotubes, it's too delicate, you know, as of right now. Right. And Moses say, you know, hopefully they can develop something that's wearable. Uh, yeah, uh, it'll have to have vivid colored hands, otherwise you'll lose your watch and, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. on, a, on any black background, yeah. you'll be yeah. screwed, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go from there to uh, the Patek 5326, right? So I love this watch and I also really liked it because it was the first watch that uh, Telly Stern had designed with his, his sons as well, right? Mm -hmm. When I looked at it initially, I was like, wow, it's a very like refreshing and very young looking watch. Um, it, you know, I guess it's got like full on vintage loom, which was not something you would normally associate with Patek, right? right. Um, but somehow it really works. So what I love about it from a functional perspective is it's really cool. It's an annual calendar, but with the, the travel time complication as right. well. But there's no pushers on the case. So now the travel time complication has been integrated fully into the crown. So it, it's kind of like this greatest hits of like Patek Coats. It's got this stunning like occluded pari like decoration on the case band, which is, uh, I think was, Reminiscent of the 6119 from uh, the Calatrava family, uh, well, the new Calatrava that they, re they, they launched. Um, and then it's got this, uh, it's got the syringe-shaped hands. Um, it's got the case design that's reminiscent of the inline perpetual calendar from last year, but it's also reminiscent of like the old 3448, right. for example, right? It's got this incredible dial that it's got this, initially this texture, which I couldn't tell what it was, but just this really rough, hewn, almost like, uh, I thought it was like an aggressively sandblasted texture. Yeah, I hope I don't insult Mr. Stern, but you know, my first impression was that it looks like the powder coating in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> and you've, got to, you, you, you've got to look, you've got to look closer. I was looking, I was only looking at press photos, so please forgive me. It, it, so apparently <laughs> it is uh, inspired by a, a vintage camera body. So oh, right? yes, yes. So I think yes, he was over at someone's yeah. house, he saw the vintage cameras, and then he, and he ended up using this for the dial. But I think it's such an unusual choice in combination with kind of the vintage colored loom and so on that you have a watch that is, is super striking and, right. and but very fresh feeling at the same time and then when I found out that it was in fact the watch that he designed together with his sons um, it made it even more charming yeah and, and, and it makes sense it's you know like you said it's youthful it's contemporary and yes. you know maybe it's the new direction of Pat, uh, Patek is taking because when Thierry Stern took over uh, Patek and he was given a brief by his father Philippe uh, he had to design a watch that was his own, and right. I think Thierry Stern is doing the same with his own children right now. That's cool. Um, yeah, and that was a 5970. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Which one you of, have. I, that's one of my favorite <laughs> watches. Um, okay, so what's your second choice? I think I'll have to go to Cartier. Wow, but it's you're going to have to twist my arm because there were so many good ones. Yeah. The Mass Mysterios, uh, the Crash Tigre. But I think I have to go back to to a classic, which is the Tank Louis. Yeah, phenomenal. Uh, I think they've just updated the Art Deco, you know, uh, design cues with uh, geometric rectangular shapes inside the dial with contrasting uh, colors in there, and I think it just looks fantastic. Yeah, and Cartier has been knocking it out of the park. Yeah, after you. Absolutely. You know, I also, I fell in love with the uh, the Santos Dumont, which they created as well, oh, with yeah. the black dial, and then with the black lacquer inlay and the bezel right. as well. Which That's I a hot one. Uh, so I think I've already uh, spent money on that watch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you go to the fair and right. come back broke. Oh, you bought this as well. Uh, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so uh, um, I guess my uh, third watch is going to be a watch that was created by Van Cleef and Arpels, right? And this watch is called uh, Leur Floral, and it is extraordinary. Um, if you look at it, there's a sort of like uh, miniature sculpture plus translucent enamel on the dial to create this sort of garden of beautiful flowers. Uh, and what's amazing is that all these flowers are automatons. And um, every time you have a new hour, the, the certain number of flowers will open to represent that number. So if it's six o'clock, six flowers will open. You'll see the irises of a flower, right? But what's amazing about it is that each time the flowers open, the pattern is random or apparently random. Right. And that is what's so intriguing about that. And you know, um, when, when Van Cleef and Ar Arpels created this sort of genre poetic complication back in the day with the fairy watch, right? Um, I immediately found it so charming because they were taking watches and they were taking complications but using them in a new way. And this is certainly one of those. It's so unexpected, it's so fresh, it's so like, you know, uplifting to see this watch. So uh, Van Cleef and Arpels, the combination of these incredible metier de art with this uh, a wonderful system of reading time, you know, which also is great because, in fact, we never really need a, a way to read time on a exactly. wristwatch, you know. Uh, it's just to purely give you joy and emotion. Um, I loved it. All right. So what would be your third watch? Number three. Okay. 
I would have to say the Tudor Black Bay Pro. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. That watch, I mean, I've, I've heard, you know, people who are for and, and against it, but I think Tudor has the space to be what Rolex cannot be right now. I think where Rolex is being positioned uh, in, in the market, yeah. Tudor can be that, it can be the actual tool watch, but have that, those vintage cues. I mean, with the Black Bay 58, you know, that's so popular, even uh, the Black Bay Chrono, but now with the Black Bay Pro, and I think it's, you can see the design uh, hearkening back to which Explorer is it? The 165. Yeah, 1655. Yeah, yeah, with the orange hand, yeah. uh, with the 24 hour bezel. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting because the Explorer 2 actually had its anniversary last year, right? And I, I think everyone was was kind of speculating that we would see like a 1655 a kind of like themed Explorer 2, which we didn't see. And it was really cool to see that, in fact, Tudor ended up making that watch yeah. uh, this year. But it was, yeah, uh, Black Bay Pro's absolutely wonderful looking watch, stunning, um, visually stunning. So every year, Tudor also makes me spend money on watches as well, right? So I remember I bought the Black Bay uh, Bronze last okay. year. Uh, I pretty much buy one of their watches almost every year. Right. Um, and then, so this year with the Pro. Is I, that going to be your pick? I think it's going to have to be. It's, you know. Um, okay, so I'm going to go from there to another watch that I've, I've asked for allocation for and then I, until I realized I go, Shit, I'm not sure if I can afford this watch. But it's the Vacheron Constantin 222, which, oh my gosh. dude, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just absolutely killer, right? It, okay, if you want to talk about the award for the hottest watch, like the just the full-on sexiest watch of the watch year so far, it's hands down the Vacheron Constantin 222, right? Uh, so as you guys know, that watch was created in 1977 by York Heisig. So in response, I guess, to the you know Royal Oak, uh, to the two Genta watches, the, the 1972 Royal Oak, the 5402, and the 1976 Nautilus, the 3700 1A. Uh, so in 1977, uh, York Heisig designed this watch, um, and it's stunning. It's it's I've always liked this watch. I've always thought it to be absolutely ravishing. I love the fluted bezel. I love the tono shape. I love the, uh, the Maltese cross that's facing you on right. uh, on the case. Um, I, it's it's also one of those watches that was created like the other first two watches to have this really interesting dynamic tension between really muscular presence on the wrist and actually a very slim profile as well. So when I was reading the um, uh, press release on it, I noticed immediately that it was using not the caliber, um, which is basically the same movement as the 2121. Yeah, it's um, a JLC. Approach. Right, yeah, which is based on the JLC ultra thin automatic um, uh, movement. And, and incidentally, uh, Vacheron does use that movement, so it uses it in the overseas ultra thin, and it uses it also as the base um, caliber for the overseas ultra thin perpetual calendar as well. So they have access to that movement, you know, e easy access to that movement. But they decided to use the caliber two four five five instead. What? Why? Well, it's a four hertz movement, so it's a little bit more reliable. It's got longer power reserve as well. Um, it's, but it has a quick set date, and I think that you know so. <laughs> for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, uh, a watch with a 2121 in it, basically you pull the crown and then you have to go from 9 o'clock with your hour hand to 12 o'clock and then back again back to set the date. And it gets to be a little bit um, idiosyncratic, yeah. uh, I think is the way to put it. Yeah, right? it probably wears the movement out. So. Well, then also, I mean, and incidentally, Jeremiah is a watchmaker, so it, when he says something like that, he, he's talking from experience. And and if you look at the you know 16202 that was launched this year as well with the 7121, um, AP now has also resolved that problem for yeah. themselves too. So I think that everyone's kind of moving away from the vintage movements, which doesn't bother me at all. And anyway, if you look at the 222 in the flesh, oh my God, it's stunning. It's so beautifully finished. Do we uh, know the price? Uh, I have an approximation in my head, but uh, it's also an approximation that does not equate with the amount of money in my bank account. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I will try, guys. I will try for you because, uh, you know, uh, right. We, I mean, we hope to see it yeah, in, yeah. in the office. If, yeah. if I can't be the guy that represents um, horological acquisition with huge fiscal irresponsibility, I don't know who should be as well. So what's your fourth choice? My fourth would have to be from IWC. And I actually covered IWC for this, for this fair and previously I mean, I have to be honest, I wasn't a fan of the pilot's chronograph. I didn't understand it. I didn't really know much about the history, but having had to cover it, you know, I'm completely in love with it, especially the ones in the colored yeah. the ceramic. Yeah. And I learned that IWC has already, or had started developing colored ceramics way back, I think in the eighties. Yeah. So it's not just Rado who, you know, claims to be the master of materials. You know, IWC has been doing it for decades. Right. And I think IWC is, um, partnered with Pantone to come up with the exact shade. And 
when I dug a little deeper, to, you know, at first I thought maybe they had to work with Pantone for intellectual property reasons, but it's actually to come up with the exact shade because different parts of um, the watch, right, it may color differently and they needed to have a uh, reference color to try to match, you know, every small little piece to be exactly the same, to be uniform. Right. So there's a lot of innovation going on. Well, I mean, I, you know, to me, IWC has always been on the vanguard of material innovation. First titanium, you know, uh, watch yeah. back in the day with Porsche design. Um, so ceramic also, they were making machine cases out of uh, out of ceramic. So out of solid blocks of ceramic as yeah. opposed to casting ceramic right. as well. It, it's a much harder technique because there's so much wear on tools as well. Right. And I think that that's where, you know, they they really position their use of of materials like titanium, like ceramic, like ceritanium, really in the luxury space as well. Mm. They were the first one to create the um, the first ceramic uh, pilot's chronograph, the 3705, which they did a tribute to a few years back. Um, but now they've taken the, like the, the iconography of that watch and applied it to creating watches that are so engaging from a visual perspective because of this use of colored ceramic and because right. every element uh, matches so perfectly as well. And it's interesting because when I look at it, I think the smartest CEOs are making like every watch in their collection iconic. You know, it's, it used to be like, oh, here are a couple of icons and then here's some other, you know, here are the rest of the watches, right? But I think the smartest CEOs like Ciro Veneral, like Chris Granger are taking their watches and making every one of those watches in their collection be meaningful and be perennial. And yeah. so I th those like watches that were created this year really feel that way to me. Okay, so the last watch I want to talk about is um, a Chopard LUC watch. And it's a watch that I had the opportunity to look at last year, um, but I'm finally able to talk about it now as well. And it is the Full Strike uh, Sapphire. Wow. So, so the Full Strike Sapphire is the world's first minute repeater using sapphire crystal gongs that are created monoblock with the sapphire of the watch itself, right? So that was created uh, back in 2016 with the very first Full Strike uh, minute repeater. But what's happened now is they've taken that technology and placed it into an actual sapphire crystal case. And good God, that watch is not only stunning to behold, but majestic to listen to. And I, I remember um, I had the opportunity to listen to that watch in the company of both Mr. Schoifla, but also uh, Gautier Capuçon, who's one of the most famous cellists in the world. And so his ear is highly attuned to new sonic nuance, right. right? And he was listening to it and he was like, guys, this thing is insane. It's just so beautiful sounding. And I think that that's what I love about yeah, that because, watch. Sorry, for conventional thinking, you know, for a minute repeater, we often think that you have to have a gold case because gold is soft and gives a warmer tone. Right. But how do you feel that compares with sapphire? So I guess there's um, different uh, um, there's different theories towards this. I think that like traditional brands have always used gold. Uh, the most you know badass ones will occasionally drop platinum just because it's so hard to make a platinum yeah. repeater. A lot of them will use steel. Um, uh, because it still is, you know, it, it resonates very well, and then titanium because titanium resonates really well, also, right? But each of them has a very different sound. Um, so steel and titanium have more of like a high pitch kind of sound, whereas gold has a very warm sound, and, tit and platinum has kind of a, a deep sound as right. well, right? Um, so what you're trying to think about also is not just um, the loudness of the repeater, but it's the song, right? The distinction, How does it, is the song beautiful, is it distinct? And I think that what's great about the Chopin LUC minute repeaters is that they are largely, um, the technology is largely independent of the material of the case, right? Because sound is being transmitted through the gongs directly through the front of the watch through the sapphire crystal. But of course the case does add something. And so the addition of the sapphire crystal um, it just creates something that's just extraordinary sounding, right? It's, it's, so um, Carl Friedrich Schweifler says that the inspiration was basically when you have two like high quality crystal champagne flutes, you know, uh, toasting each other and they ring and you can okay. hear it from across the room. That's what he wanted to achieve. Right. And this is like as if the whole room had, you know, was toasting at the same time wow. and hitting their glasses at exactly the same precise moment. It's quite a description. It's, st <laughs> it's staggering. Right. If I go for my number five pick. Yes. I think probably the elephant in the room is we haven't talked about Rolex. Ah, <laughs> we yes. should, we should yeah, talk we about the left-handed, the uh, yeah, the GMT Master. And I have to say, when I first looked at it, 
I didn't get it. I, I didn't understand. Was there a precedent before uh, Rolex no. doing something like that? Completely Never. not, right? The, the, the watches that you'll see from some famous uh, dealers or journalists that are Destros are Destros they made in their basement. Right? Okay. So there are no uh, Rolex Destros out there. Right? Yeah. Um, so, but you know, so that was the very first watch that I saw when I walked into the fair. In fact, I ran over to the window um, like a child with, like outside of a candy shop and pressed my face against there, heating up the glass with my breath. I think you were hoping for a Daytona, no? Slo, slo, no, I, but, but, <laughs> but I, I, oh yeah, I was hoping. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Daytona. As soon as I saw this, I was like, dude, mind blown. Um, I loved it. Uh, and I still, I still love it. And, and I'm not just saying that because if there's anyone from Rolex out there who's like, oh, he's saying decent things about the watch, maybe we should allocate him one. <laughs> but if you are, I, dude, I accept. Uh, but, but, but no, I'm joking. The, the, the point is, it was just completely out of left field. There's yeah. no precedent for it whatsoever. Uh, there's no communication in terms of why they would do it. Right. They just dropped it. Yeah. Uh, but I love that about Rolex as yes. well. And at the end, you judge a watch based on like, do you think it's beautiful? And it's absolutely stunning to behold. Also, the new color of the ceramic for the bezel also was absolutely stunning too. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. What's the nickname for the watch now? I, it, it's... Sure. I, I don't either. I don't think <laughs> yeah. one has like a, a consensus, think, think, yeah. consensus has emerged yet. Take some time. Right. Uh, I'm, you know, going, trying to get everyone to call it the Grogu from, from uh, yeah, Mandalorian, but maybe that's too obscure of a reference. Right. Um, but anyway, like, I just thought it was incredible. Now, everyone's like, ah, but you know, do you use it on your right, do your left wrist? I'm like, bro, are you actually using your mechanical watch to like launch a rocket or something? <laughs> you know, you're just wearing your watch because yeah. it's cool to have, yeah. right? So it doesn't matter. I probably, I, I probably think most people wear on the left as well. Exactly, right? And yeah. well, actually, to be fair, like the other brand that made Destros for ages were Pat, was Panerai. Mm. And everyone I know that owned a Destro, like 99% of them were wearing them on their left-hand side right. anyway, right? right. You yeah. know, and it was cool. So what, what do I feel about it? I think it's cool, right? I think a lot of times when you have controversy about something like that is because people are upset they can't get one exactly. and that i understand because yes no one will be able to get one right yeah. uh, i mean it's the the problem now is you have such a huge disparity between the number of people that want dope watches especially rolexes and the number of rolexes that the, the brand is capable of making they can't scale up production you know overnight to, to and nor would they i mean understanding a little bit about them um i put it this way like so, like, if you think about the number of like luxury watches that are made in in the world, um, luxury Swiss watches that are made every year, two point five, three million watches, something like that. That is like that's the totality of the Swiss watch industry, luxury watches, right? Like the that's the equivalent of the output of one of the major car brands every year, and then and there's got to be 30, 40, yeah. 50 car brands out there, right? Yeah. So everyone that wants a cool car, like, also wants to own a nice luxury watch, you already have this massive disparity. And then also, um, Rolex is of course going to be the first watch that everyone wants because it's the best known and also occupies basically half of the production of, of luxury Swiss watches, uh, yeah. right? Um, so yes, I understand that it's frustrating. I've also been um, experienced the frustration myself, right? right? Um, but I don't think that that should be a factor in terms of judging that watch. Like right. I think that watch is really cool. And then also don't forget that there was an updated Air King as well. That would have been my fifth pick. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Now they have elevated the Air King to, you know, professional status, if I could describe it that way. You know, with the flat uh, case band sides, adding a zero to the five minute marker gives it more symmetry. Yeah, with I, I think it's incredible. Oh, and there's a new movement as well, the three two three zero, the Chrono G escapement. Yeah. Nice. Before I think Air Kings were only labeled as precision watches, not you know chronometers, but that has completely changed. I think that's going to be in the next unobtainium Rolex. Yeah, seeing the watch in the flesh also, and then seeing they were really cool. They brought the outgoing watch and the new watch together. It's a remarkable difference in terms of like how uh, much. I don't know, richer, visually, visually richer the, the watch looks and feels. It's just absolutely spectacular. The use of this kind of gloss style is, is stunning as well. Um, it's super legible. It's just a perfectly rendered watch. There was also a little suitcase of rainbow Daytonas as well, which I, I had the opportunity to look at, but wasn't right. allowed to take pictures of. Have you made a decision? Dude. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how I ended up in this situation, but like, yes, I, I, now all I do is I go home at night and okay. dream about Rainbow Daytona. So they're okay. an incredible array of them. But anyway, look, that's our uh, Watches and Wonders, or I should say Watch Fair 
period of 2022. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Jeremiah, it was a pleasure, sir. Always great.